There's uh, three that I'm kind of focusing on for this session. Uh, iterative innovation, radical innovation, and simplification, which could be considered a, a form of, of innovation, taking something core and turning it to more casual. We see a lot of that happening today. Um, and just basically, here's a, a bunch of games I just kind of randomly picked. And uh, maybe you can just yell out, blurt out, what kind of innovation does each one represent? We'll start with uh, Pac-Man. Would you say it's, it was a, an iterative, a radical, or a simplification innovation? Anybody? You can just yell it out. Radical, right? Exactly. Of course, at that period of time, pretty much everything that came out was radical. <laughs> There's no competition. Yeah. But Ladybug, how many here remember Ladybug? Okay, yeah, don't, yeah, don't be embarrassed because I grew up on Ladybug. But uh, okay, let me see if I can actually get this thing to work with the super ultra low resolution. Which will be interesting. And with no bandwidth. So just so in case, for those of you who are too young to remember this game, there it is. Iterative innovation, right? So what, what did they iterate? Uh, what did they add to Pac-Man? Sorry? Shifting walls. Pretty, pretty clever idea. Yeah? Anything else you notice that they added on to Pac-Man to make it a little bit more innovative, a little bit more interesting? The uh, extra, see the, see the dots going around the edge, the, the colors? When uh, those colors change, you can actually get the letters in the, in the maze and unlock specials and unlock extras and even lives. The game gets ridiculously hard too. I'll, I'll fast forward a bit. But if you haven't played this one, download MAME and download this ROM and play this. It's really good. Called Ladybug. And that was an example of iterative innovation. Okay, now we're going to go back here to uh, Zaxxon. What would you say, Zaxxon? Radical? or iterative. Anybody even remember Zaxxon? Jeez, I'm so old. Okay, go ahead. Sorry? Radical, exactly. You could argue that Zaxxon was kind of Gallica meets 3D, but they added so much more. It was pretty much a, a radical innovation. It was like the first, I think it was with probably the first 3D game, or isometric 3D uh, arcade game, and everybody got, got hooked on it. Chuzzle, you want to take a stab at it? Iterative, radical, simplification. Okay, let's take a quick look at it. Huh? So this is a PopCap game. The ones who basically kickstarted the casual game industry with Bejeweled. All right. Okay. <laughs> Simplification. Okay, excellent. You could you could say iterative, but yeah, simplification is true. Actually, I find this way easier to play than Bejeweled. Swapping versus just sliding for a lot of people is that's a simplification. So, good one. You're gonna win the grand prize, whatever that is. Okay, how about this one? If you haven't played this one, definitely. You can play uh, the Flash version or the PS or PlayStation version. Genova Chen's master game designer came up with this really amazing experiential game that has no levels or discernible levels. Okay, iterative, radical, or simplification. Some people say this is Pac Man without walls. Radical innovation, exactly. I would consider this to be radical innovation. There wasn't anything quite like it. It was a, a thesis project for the Fred University uh, uh, project there. And uh, so based on this game, have there been any similar type games to come out? Have anybody been able to go to the innovation area? What game here kind of reminds you of this? Letopus, exactly. Go play it if you get a chance. But uh, I, feel, I kind of feel like... Uh, Latipus uh, actually went well far beyond flow in terms of gameplay. Well, oh, this isn't actually Latipus. Okay. By the way, uh, 
I love this game. I'm gonna download it. But just notice how maybe somebody got inspired by Flow and decided to innovate iteratively on it. same thing, except instead of like eating your enemies, you're sort of like whiplashing with your braids. Yeah. So, fairly, fairly uh, nice uh, enhancement to the flow concept. It wasn't a flow in the flow, it was really a true, in my opinion, a true innovation. Very simple to pick up and play, so I think this game should do so well. Okay, let's go continue our pop quiz. For those who just entered in, please, uh, there's plenty of seats up front. And we're throwing out cash prizes to the first two rows. <laughs> you know, just kidding. And then fill up the seats, because I think that we're actually, uh, a lot of the people from the previous session are, are taking the seats, so but there's, there's at least 10 seats up here. So please come in. We're actually doing a quiz to see if you know what, uh, which games are iteratively innovative, Radical or a simplification. Let's talk about Crush the Castle. It's one of my favorites. How many here played Crush the Castle? Okay, you guys were part of the whatever 18 million hits that I got in like the first week. This is Joey Betts. Uh, he was my first intern. Uh, recruited him into Say Design from the local university. He won three of our game competitions in a row. Him and his team. So he came on board. Uh, Say Design is uh, one of our designers and programmers. And he whipped out, didn't necessarily whip out, but he came up with this game called Crush the Castle, which was a phenomenal hit on uh, most of the Flash game portals out there. Oh, bloody Ligori. But man, uh, my whole studio was hooked on this game for a long time. I had to fire all of them because they weren't getting any work done. But, uh, just kidding. So, Radical, iterative, uh, simplification, innovation, what would, you, what would you call this? It's kind of a trick question. Radical? Iterative. Iterative, okay. Why would you say iterative? Uh, Angry Birds. This was before Angry Birds. <laughs> yeah, this is what got Roby excited about Angry Birds. Okay. Yeah. The innovation comes from the kids, not the adults, <laughs> usually. So, he was a kid. So, I would say radical. It's the first one. It, actually, it was based on a game that was sort of not quite that, but inspired him, and he iterated on something else. So it's actually sort of iterative radical. His was the first to become real famous. So I think you both are right. So that means the, uh, the most famous of all, let me close this out, uh, continue our pop quiz, Angry Birds. Now, what would you say? <laughs> Everybody say at the same time, it is an, what kind of innovation? Iterative. Iterative. Nothing wrong with iterative because they succeeded, didn't they? They actually made a, a mega hit from a mechanic that was pretty much already popular on the Flash game portals. But they took it and they refined it. They did a lot of good things to make it more accessible to an international audience. And they got featured on the App Store, which is really important. Okay, so going back to our, our pup quiz before I have to really dive deep into, uh, this is one of my favorite games of all time. How many people have gotten hooked on um, Peggy 12. this game? Okay, only like 20% like of you guys, you have to get this game. If you don't have this game because you're on the PlayStation, buy a PlayStation just for this game. There is so much innovation wrapped into this. And all the game really is, um, is nothing but bosses. You know, there's no real grinding to get to a boss. Basically, you travel to the boss, and an hour later when you find the boss, you try to kill the boss, which takes hours, because they're about the size of Mount Everest. So they were able to take uh, sort of a a common third person type of a game, it's sort of a shooter, but climbing, and uh, basically the focus is on taking down these giant goliaths. Definitely a huge inspirational game that 
highly recommend. So that ends the pop quiz. So you guys all did wonderful because we were supposed to do that at the end of the presentation, but we were trying to fill up some time. So now we go back to the beginning of the presentation. So all of you that just came in uh, can, can uh, get the whole presentation. This was actually an hour and a half presentation. I just found out I only have half an hour. So I'm going to go kind of fast, so hopefully you don't mind. I might skip some things, but don't worry, you'll have the PowerPoint for later. You can go through with a fine tooth comb if you like. All right. OK, so I will not play that music again. You guys had to endure that at the beginning. OK, so how the passion started. I personally got my addiction to video games in the early 70s to mid 70s with games like Pac-Man in the arcades. Uh, the game started to infiltrate our home with the Pong console, Atari 2600, uh, in the, into the schools with the ColecoVision um, handheld LED. These are all things that sort of corrupted me as a child. And then my dad bought me a TLS-80, Trash-80 Coco uh, in 1979, and that's where I learned how to program and, and make my own games, just as a, as a side hobby. But that planted the seed that sort of grew into this sort of lifelong obsession of just loving games and making games and innovation. Uh, my company is called Say Design. We've been in business for about 23 years. I'm actually 24 years old, so started quite young. Uh, last year, I moved to Shanghai, so we're actually trying to expand our business into Asia, and that's one of the reasons why I'm here in Singapore. Um, here's our areas of focus. I tell everybody we have no focus in the company. We actually have lots of different focuses, but you know we're spread a bit thin. We, we do cross-platform games, virtual worlds, MMOs. We're really going deep into serious and educational games with the uh, universities in California. Uh, we do original IP development. We help bring games to Western audiences. We're even now working with uh, Disney on theme park rides, which are turning more into, theme park rides are turning into games, basically, but more like holodeck, you know, uh, environment games. Um, we work with a lot of different partners globally, mostly in the States, but uh, we work not only with game publishers, we also work with a lot of uh, children and family media companies, and even some weird things like uh, we're working with um, Humana, which is a healthcare company on healthcare games. Edison Learning, we're building a, a virtual world high school, middle school, um, working with uh, you know different uh, soft software companies on various Adver games. So it's really all over the map. We pretty much accept any project that's uh, sort of family friendly, uh, and uh, that allowed us to sort of like really push all of our uh, creative muscles in every possible direction. So why is game design so important? Masquerading as a normal person, day after day is exhausting. Life can be boring. Life can be broken in, in a lot of different ways. So that means our job is really extremely important. The world needs fun games. Gamers are a very passionate audience. How many of you have seen this t-shirt? Video games ruin my life. Good thing I have two extra lives. After a while, life after a while, they go on to another game. They make new friends, new relationships, and they just keep going because they're, they're kind of uh, just obsessed. And they do and more so than ever, demand fresh, innovative gameplay. So it's really up to us. So the question is, what kind of game developer do you aspire to be? You better choose wisely, because uh, you don't want to make uh, Yoda angry, right? Yes, we all want to be not the cloners, but really the innovators, the ones who are willing to go out there and really uh, come up with new and exciting ideas. So these are just a few of the principles we're going to dive into. Um, know what it means to innovate. We already had a nice little preview of the different kinds of innovation. Keep inspired. Uh, make sure that you have fun mechanics. KISS principle. Grow organically. will give uh, better long-term results. Replay value. And even solve real-world problems with games. We'll talk a little bit about that. So first exactly, what is a game? They're goal-driven activities or experiences. They challenge players in a fun way, allows them to grow and learn, uh, reward their achievements, give them a sense of progression. And really, if you think about it, all of these things are basically life. This is, these are the things that drive us as human beings in everyday interactions and leveling up in, in, as a human being. So being a game designer is really just being observant about life and borrowing from uh, a lot of those experiences to create simulations or games that simulate the pleasure of life. Key to innovation, Einstein said it best. Imagination is more important than knowledge. You may know how to build a game, we you know all the physics in the world, know how to like reverse engineer other games to make, see what make them tick and monetize. But if you have no imagination, that's not really, uh, that's not really a good thing, not for, not for innovation. 
So let's talk about the first uh, most common form of iteration, uh, innovation, which is iterative. It's the most common. It's basically gradually improving on other things that have already been done. There's nothing wrong with it. Uh, oftentimes, it results in more complexity. But we see now uh, innovation can actually be simplification of complex things. It's healthy for the industry. And it's definitely less risky than the uh, radical innovation, because even games that are incredible uh, may not really sell, because people are just freak out. Uh, iterative innovation, here's an example of a game I'm working on uh, called Doodle Sky. Basically, the inspiration was flight control, where you're just basically landing these planes on different landing strips. And so what we did is took that and just sort of mixed it with dogfighting. So now, instead of landing, you're actually going out and killing all the other planes and keeping your wingman alive and all sorts of simple fun. And uh, because of time, I'm not going to show very many game trailers. Um, but you'll have the slide. You can click on that link later and watch the, the game trailers. Here are some uh, radical innovation examples. Of course, in the old days, uh, with Donkey Kong and Pac-Man and so forth, they were all radical innovations because they were the first of their genre. It was genre defining, like the platformer. Uh, Res was more recent, like maybe, I think, probably 10 years ago. Um, and that was like a shooting game that actually combined music with shooting. Uh, and it was really just put you in this surreal state. It was just a really relaxing, fun game. You felt like you were, you were playing this freaky, futuristic uh, instrument and basically being your own band. Braid, uh, I have to show the trailer for Braid, because to me, it's just, how many here have played Braid? OK, quite a few of you. And it, basically, they took game and they mixed it with uh, time travel or time distortion. Level, you, if you go right, it goes forward in time. If you go left, it goes backwards in time. That added a whole completely dynamic uh, puzzle aspect to the game. Okay, so please download this and you can get it on Steam and so forth and just enjoy it. Lots of great examples uh, like this. Okay, um, so radical innovation is still, it's, it's hard to pull off now because everything's already been done. <laughs> not really. Um, but it's not impossible. There are ways to, to come up with some radical, crazy innovations. Sometimes you have to look to things like science or go outside into the woods you know, and, and come up with some these radical innovation, uh, innovative ideas that are yet to happen. OK, simplification is a pretty important one, especially for casual games. Um, take a difficult game, like a core game, remove what makes it so challenging for the casual player. And uh, now you're going to appeal to not only the casual gamers, but you're actually going to appeal to the core gamers who just want maybe a, a less stressful way of playing that same mechanic. Some examples here are Tower Defense was sort of like a more of a uh, core game, and Plants vs. Zombies casualized it quite well. Crush the Castle, Joey Betts, that was actually a very difficult game. The, the whole launching mechanism was like, you really had to work hard at, at it. Whereas Angry Birds, if you could fling a rubber band, you were good. And uh, some other examples of, of social games that basically were basically sp uh, sprung off of a more hardcore game, game themes. Here's just a, some visual example. Real-time strategy was casualized to become Tower Defense, which was casualized to become Plants vs. Zombies. OK? All right. Thank you. Uh, we already talked about uh, Crush the Castle, Hardcore, Angry Birds, Casual. So uh, here we have uh, extending games into real world innovations, such as uh, we see here the Parrot Drone, where you can actually have dogfights with drones. So they combine uh, virtual reality and actual reality. Because uh, CIA uh, can't be having all the fun, drones. So if you ever get a chance to play with this parrot drone, it is, it is absolutely amazing. Actually, it's more fun to just crash the, the parrot drones together and try to take down your opponent than to play through the iPhone, the, the shoot 'em up games. Another example, Parallel Kingdom, basically maps uh, an RPG over your neighborhood. 
So you can totally dominate your neighborhood by running around parks and so forth and picking up power-ups and leveling up your character. Another really great example. Fusion innovation is where you take uh, chocolate and peanut butter and you make Reese's peanut butter cups. Apart, they're good, but together they're just amazing. So here you see sort of Pac-Man meets uh, 3D with uh, crystal castles. How many of you play crystal castles? Me and you, dude. We got <laughs> okay, I <laughs> have a few <laughs> honest people. Okay. Here's, here's one, uh, here's an example on the airplane. Um, there's a couple sitting next to me, and as a game designer, I'm always thinking about game ideas. So they were playing Sudoku, like, for three hours without talking to each other the entire flight. I was like, oh, this is crap. So how do you make it a multiplayer experience? So what popped in my head was the grid. I was looking at the Sudoku grid they were playing on. I'm like, that's tic-tac-toe. So why not then, you know, they can both play separately, but on another sheet of paper, they can be doing the uh, X's and O's depending on who finishes the uh, square first. So the first person to finish the middle square could actually get the uh, X or the O, and now they have multiplayer Sudoku. And this is the, uh, an example of what it might look like as a team versus team or a player versus player. Never built it, but, uh, you know, it's a good idea. Here we took uh, Bookworm and mixed it with poker. This is my first casual game of play first. It actually did pretty well. Uh, especially on mobile. And uh, another example is Taking Tempest, which is a real arcade type game and mixing with Bubble Bubble. And um, came up with this game called uh, Candy Shot, which I think I have right here already preloaded. Yeah, I think. Which, oh, right here, okay. So this is what you get if you mix Tempest with Bubble Bubble. Anyway, okay, so moving along, what if you mixed puzzles with fractals? You would get puzzles inside of puzzles inside of puzzles. So this is like our first Xbox uh, live arcade game where you can actually um, play multiplayer and uh, one puzzle could have millions of pieces instead of just hundreds or thousands of pieces just by drilling down into the puzzle pieces. The real a thematic innovation, so th this is a concept we're working on called uh, nanotroopers. It's basically inside the body. This is inside the brain. Multiplayer first-person shooter. So instead of like, coming with a whole new first-person shooter mechanic, we just basically borrow what's proven, but put it inside the body and wrap um, immunology and, and medicine around it. Here's some, uh, some fancy art. Actually building a not-to-scale nanite that you would pilot into the body and save the entire human race. Okay, inspiration drives innovation. I'm gonna have to speed this up. Uh, inspiration comes to slowly and quietly, prime it with a little solitude. So if your workload increases, guess what? As a game designer, your inspiration decreases and it actually hurts you. <laughs> the ideas slow down. So it's important to have a good quality of life uh, type of a job as a game designer. And uh, Geneva Chan said it best here, doing things that you think people need but are missing always leads to innovation. You know, look for opportunities to get people what they really need. But doing things that are popular and making money doesn't lead to innovation. It leads to cloning and uh, really hurts the industry in different ways. Here's some sources of inspiration. Uh, flash portals, uh, definitely. Like, uh, for example, Crush Castle was a top flash game that got everybody inspired to make stuff like Angry Birds. Um, you can check out uh, also the emulators. I highly recommend going back to the past. These games that you never heard of, play them. There's a lot of hidden gems going back several decades. Toy stores, walk around toy stores. There's a lot of board games that need to become iPad and iPhone games and so forth. Even arts and crafts. This is a game concept we're working on called uh, Pop Art, where you actually use uh, drawing paint, watercolors to, to paint uh, these beautiful drawings. Uh, anybody can innovate game ideas. Kids are the best. Like I mentioned, Joy Butts was my first intern. He came in, I think he was like maybe 18 years old, and he did a phenomenal job with Crush the Castle. Um, there's also some really great game builder tools, playcrafter.com and Game Salad, where basically children are making amazing games and concepts and sharing them with the world. So traffic those sites. This was a, a challenge that EA did nationwide. This was the submission that won out of thousands of submissions. In fact, all three of his crayon drawings were in the top five that EA chose 
uh, to be the winners of this nationwide uh, competition. He won $10,000 he's putting towards college. And uh, here's the uh, headline news, and, and then we actually helped him actually build the game and, and put it up on EA, EA's website. You can play it, uh, just Google EA Rhythm. It's basically the innovation, by the way, was music uh, affects the environment. So if you're playing rock music, the environment turns to a different kind of substance than if you're playing classical music. It changes gravity and everything. So it's a pretty, pretty clever idea. And uh, he thought of the class, he thought of the idea when he was daydreaming in school. He was in an art class just sort of thinking about game ideas. So that's why the kids have the time to actually come up with these ideas. So you need to tap into those kids. Fun mechanics. These are uh, examples of fun, these aren't fun mechanics. This is fun mechanics. Game designers uh, have to understand your audience. So creating a fun mechanic really depends on who you're trying to appeal to. Left, right. Casual gamer, scary gamer on the right. Casual gamer, they're down with this button. This is not good. Dream on. <laughs> right click. Forget about it. No, no scroll wheel. Hardware gamer, um, you need the TKA, right? That's what you need. <laughs> Outstanding. But hey, there's no haptic gloves or 3D VR goggles. So he's not completely happy, but getting there. So if you have multiple target audiences, and uh, <laughs> uh, you uh, want to focus on these three, who do you really, really target? Casual, exactly. Leave no gamer behind, right? And that's really your, where your big success is going to be with the casual and the non-gamers if they adopt your game. Uh, again, I'm going to have these slides available later so you can uh, go through these in detail. I'm running out of time. Um, so I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. Uh, tips for creating good game mechanics. I'll tell you the secret here is experiment liberally and the stuff that really is cool, iterate to death. Then you will have your gem of core game mechanic and then you build all the rest of your game around that core or seed. I'll skip all this stuff. Okay, KISS principle. This is a very important principle. Keep it simple, stupid. And that's not a put down. It's keep it simple and stupid enough for any stupid person to even figure out your game. And uh, just because we can do stuff doesn't mean we should. We have, we have to justify anything we add to a game mechanic or a gameplay to, uh, to make sure that it stays simple and accessible to your lowest common denom denominator audience. And if you don't believe me, believe this guy here, Leonardo da Vinci. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And I'm sure Steve Jobs mastered that principle as well. Okay? So I'm going to move back. Basically, we're saying here Pac-Man teaches you how to play Pac-Man without any instructions. You just basically look at the colors, the behavior of the ghosts, and you figure out how to play the game. That's the, the ideal game. Okay? Leave no game behind. Uh, Organic development. I'm so sorry I have to, sp I have to pass through a lot of these, but I'm going to leave a, like a, a minute for Q&A. Okay, I have one minute left. <laughs> um, never become emotionally attached to your game design. It's illogical. You know, if you love your game, but everybody else doesn't love your game, why build the game, right? So be willing to abandon game ideas and trash them for the, for, in favor of the ones that actually are, are good. I'm going to stop here just because I, I want to squeeze in one question, in, one question from the audience. Or maybe they'll let me do one more. Anybody have any uh, questions or comments or even uh, uh, an idea or a concept or a game that you feel is a good example of innovation? A little stage right? Yeah. Nobody? Okay. Which is okay. Because I might be able to squeeze in one more slide. <laughs> okay. Let me go towards the end. Okay. This, uh, I'm going to basically jump over to this. Can games change the world? Uh, this game here called... Uh, Fold it actually did what teams of PhD scientists and supercomputers couldn't do for years. They were trying to crack a certain gene sequence or a certain protein folding problem uh, to, to help towards the AIDS epidemic, right? And they put it as a level on Fold it. And within a few weeks, one of the gamers solved it. That is a true story. You can Google it. This just shows game, game design, and accessible games can indeed uh, change the world. So the rest of these slides, there's probably like 10 other slides on this. You can download it and read those later. But thank you for, for uh, your attention. And I'm sorry. Uh, where, where can we download it? Uh, I don't know. 
Sure. And you can jot down my email address. I can email it to you in case you don't find it. It's just john at saydesign.com. Okay. I'm going to leave a bunch of business cards in the back in case you guys want to brainstorm ideas. I'll be at the party. And uh, don't be shy. Be, get in touch. Bounce ideas off of me. This is, where, this is where I get my inspiration. And um, happy to get to know you guys better. Thank you for your um, attendance. And <laughs>